everybody. Jeff here with The Embroidery Nerd, and I'm joined by Mr. Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios, The Embroidery Nerd, and 3D Puff Pro. It says so on his little monitor over there. I noticed that. <laughs> oh, but if you are in the comments, go ahead and let us know you're here. And um, today we're going to have a fun discussion, and I'm going to learn a lot too, I, I really hope so, about estimating stitch counts. So um, I thought, I, I actually had somebody come to me and say, hey, can you estimate the stitch count? And I gave it my best shot. And then I asked Justin to do it, and our numbers were very much different. Mine was slightly a couple of 10,000 stitches more. So <laughs> Justin goes, yeah, that's why I fired Jeff. Um, so we're going to go ahead and learn a little bit today about how to estimate stitch counts and what's kind of the best way to do that. Uh, before we get too far, though, I'm going to bring up a couple of comments. We have Cindy King. Good evening, y'all. Good evening, Cindy. And Marla here saying hello. We have Carol Wilson. Hello, Carol. And so, Justin, tell me what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the uh, the main thing is to kind of plan the expect if you're a digitizer or if you're just an embroiderer that kind of has in mind what they want out of the design, you know, what's going to be fill stitches, if the fill stitches are going to have satin borders, is the detail going to be satin or is it going to be running stitches? So you really need to kind of take a look at it plan it out and, and in, your, in your head know are what elements are, are what stitch types. And that way from there forward, you know, you're going to be estimating uh, by the size of the design, how much area is filled and, and whatnot. Um, I actually wrote a, a blog on estimated stitching many, many, many years ago. And I pretty much use the same uh, technique even today. Um, what I basically did was I, I, I took each stitch type, basically made a like a, a one inch square for a fill, found out how many stitches are using, you know, the, the run of the mill settings, um, uh, a linear inch for, for satins, a linear inch for, for running stitches and, and different text sizes. And I actually just threw up a, a real simple, yeah, I'll share it. A real simple uh, formula, Google Excel sheet. Oh, we got a Google Excel sheet. He did not share the Google Excel sheet with me. He's just like, let's let Jeff struggle bus it. <laughs> but while Justin's pulling that up, I'll grab a couple more comments. We have Amy here. Hello, Amy. We have Debbie from Northwest Montana. Hello, uh, Kathleen. How's it going? From Southeast Pennsylvania, we have. Margaret here from Peterborough, Ontario. Good to see you. And we have Letty as well. Hello, Letty. All right, Justin. So I'm ready. So, so when I went into my software and I and I made a, a one inch square, I found out that on average it's about 1,200 stitches. Uh, a linear inch of the satin stitches is about 175. Running is about 50. And then getting into text, I just did basically. The smaller text size, um, I did five to six millimeters, seven to eight, nine to 10, because that's typically the text size that's like underneath the design. You start getting into something that's above 10 millimeters, uh, you just start estimating that knowing, you know, the size and if it's gonna be a fill or if it's gonna be a satin stitch, and that'll just kind of revert back to the first two columns that you see that you see here. But I, I basically just brought this in and, and what I usually do, is I use Illustrator, so that's evil. <laughs> it's evil, huh? Well, yep. pretty much all, pretty much all the the main art programs out there is going to have some type of grid system that you can view on your on your workspace. Um, so what I'll do is I'll bring my artwork in. I'll make sure it's to size. I just have a lot open right now and it seems like my computer's working pretty slow, but. Way too much open. So I'm looking at your spreadsheet here. Um, it doesn't have, cause if you're running a linear inch at 175 sti stitches, stitches for a satin stitch, how mm -hmm. do you compensate for that when you know it's gonna be a puff design? Well, 
see that's the this is this is based on just normal everyday settings that's that's not taken into account that if you're if you're doing something that may need more underlay or more density you know like a, a robe or a towel or something like that so everything i do is kind of based on base it on this and then i know that if if it's um the satins are going to be 3d you know the density is going to be a lot more than uh, a normal density so so basically this is for your standard run-of-the-mill stuff it's not for any type of the specialty treatments that you would get into correct okay correct yeah so yeah because you figure a a density of, of, a, of a satin stitch is is roughly doubled so if if i if i take the linear inch of a satin and i know that there's going to be five inches of it my calculation there shows that it's 875 you would double that if you know if it's going to be puffed all right so and we again, have a question here from carol and i'm not sure if this would have any effect on that gauging how satin stitches are sh sewn but how wide is the satin so i don't think well, width plays into that because it's the density that you're measuring across the linear exactly stitch. it's the density um you, you, if if it is something where it's getting so wide that you're either going to you're going to decide that okay this is so wide that i want to go to a fill stitch or a satin fill um or if it's so wide that you know you're going to be using an excess amount of of underlay in it like you're going to do a dense double zigzag on with the edge run so i what i would do at that point is go into your software do a linear inch of, of a satin with the settings that you're looking to do and then just plug that into your to your calculations so you know if there's going to be you know six inches of linear satin stitches then it's six times whatever that value is again this is this is just based on, on normal settings, and then I go from there if I know there's any adjustments that I need to make for, for what we're doing. So, Okay, and just so um, we kind of explain why estimating the stitch count is important. Um, when you go to run these types of things on your machine, your machine, it, it can only run at a set speed. So really what this comes down to is how many minutes is going to run on your machine approximately. Now you won't really know that number until you get a hard number of color changes, a hard number of trims, um, or actually just running it on your machine and calculating that time. But ultimately if I take a, you know, if we put four times the density in a one inch circle, it's going to take four times as much time to run on the machine versus if it's just that singular piece and even then like hat designs your hats your machines tend to run at a slower speed with a hat design so it's going to take longer if it's a hat versus if it's the same exact same logo for a flat right as for digitizing i don't think right now it makes as much of a difference because it seems like most digitizing is like four inch is a flat rate uh left chest or a two inch tall hat design is also a flat rate to get it done Right, like like back in the day, a lot of digitizers would charge by the stitch count, just like embroiderers do. So they would say they would have categories, you know, zero to five thousand would be this much. Or and so, um, I actually estimated a lot more back when billing or, or, or charging for digitizing was like that. Um, I I don't get a lot of people that ask me for stitch counts, which is pretty surprising, just because in, most embroiderers are going to charge knowing how long the job's going to take um, unless it's just something where, you know, a lot of people are comfortable. They can kind of by eye, look at the design and say, all right, it's going to take me right around this area to get it done. And they know what to charge for that. Um, but most embroiders that I know actually charge by the stitch count. So that's where they're going to get their final price. Yeah. Um, and I think the majority of my customers, when they come and they get a job and they give me their logo, I say, well, to quote you, I need to know what the stitch count is. So I know how long it's going to take to run on my machine and you start to like, they, they'll say, okay, how much is that? You tell them. And most of my customers don't want an estimate first. They, they know that they're going to get it done and they just give you the, um, the money to get the digitizing done. And then they go back and they say, okay, well now you can quote the job. Um, right. 
a lot of times the prices are going to be fairly close from embroidery shop to embroidery shop. So um, we have a question here. Would you use this formula to estimate the cost to digitize as well as embroidery? No, I, I, I don't charge by the stitch count. So I, yeah. it's, it's, it's not anything that, that I'm using to, I, it's just a service that I do for, for customers if they want to know the end stitch count. Um, I, I basically charge, if anybody hasn't used me, I charge for a standard rate, depending on the, for a left chest or a hat size, depending on how many days they want it. Uh, full backs, I tend to quote by the piece just because there might be a full back that's 11 inches wide. That's two words. That's real simple. Or there's one that's got 150,000 stitches with a bunch of details. So with uh, a really yeah. off center, bad quality photo for the art. <laughs> exactly. Here's the window um, on my building. Can I get that? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so we have, we have Cindy here saying something can have a low stitch count, but can take a long time to sew because of all the trims and that's, you know, that, that runs into the efficiency of when you're digitizing. I, I, I've digitized objects where there will be a trim inserted that I didn't know was there. I'll run it on my machine. I only have to run five of them. I'll see that first trim and I'll go, oh, now I got to run five of them. And it's going to do that because it's not worth the amount of time it would come to right. set the job up again and come change everything. But sometimes it's definitely worth changing over your machine, changing your file and resetting up just to be able to save time exactly. on production. And, and it really depends too. I mean, if you have, if you have the in-house software to make that quick, quick correction, if you have an in-house digitizer, um, if you know, you can get a hold of your digitizer, if it's, if it's worth waiting and not running in, at, at that until they could actually fix it. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's just like, all right, just finish this order this time. Let's make a note of it. Let's fix the file. And that way next time it's going to run correctly. That's what a lot of times in, in my shop we do. If it's, if it's not something that's, affecting the quality or really slowing down my operators. I tell them, write a note on the spec sheet, give me the spec sheet, and that way I'll fix it for next time. Um, but what I basically do is in, in Illustrator, I set up a grid that's a, it's a one inch grid and that's just going to give me, so I bring in my artwork here. I got my, Eric's little bubble here. Um, so and he's not in the comments. No. <laughs> So basically kind of glancing at this, I know that this, this background is going to be a fill. So I have about an inch here. I got about an inch here and I'd say about three quarters of an inch to about an inch. So again, I tend to, when, when I'm looking at designs and, and, and there's that gray area, I tend to add on stitches because it's a lot better, you know, anticipating a design is going to be 10,000 and it actually being nine, uh, better than underestimating. And you're, and you're thinking that you're quoting something at 9,000 and it ends up being 12. Um, so just seeing here, I'd say like, all right, well, there's about 3.5, 3.75, you know, fill density or fill areas. So I plug that into my, to my, uh, to my spreadsheet, so 3.75. All right, and then I would probably go ahead and, and decide that I'm gonna do a satin border on this as well. So linear, linear we have one, two, three, four, five, six, say about seven satins there. This little white line is gonna be a satin, so eight, nine, 10, 11. So you plug in 11 satin stitches. Plug that in. And then the letters there. These are pretty big letters. So I'd go ahead and just treat them as satins themselves. So we have one, probably the top and bottom is two, three, about four more satins. So if I plug them into that, let's 
share this screen and that screen and this screen. Yes. All right. So with those values that I was counting up, we have about three and three quarters a square inch of fill stitch. We have about 15 linear inches of satin stitches. Calculates that. So I, at the size that I had his logo, I would have estimated about 7,000. And I'm sure if if I digitized it, I'd probably be right around there, anywhere between seven and 8,000. I'm usually, when I, when I actually bring it in and I'm not just, I've been doing it for so long that typically I can kind of just go in, look at a logo and start calculating it myself as long as it's the size on my screen and I can just count it up on my head. Uh, when I'm not trying to be too accurate, I'll do that. If I am trying to be, you know, or someone's really needing a stitch count to be accurate for pricing, I do use my spreadsheet. And I would say I'm within 2,000 stitches typically. Um, okay. So, so let's grab a comment here. We have Heather joining us from Cape Coral. Hello. And we have Letty. I feel like this is a guess the jelly beans in a jar question. I guess 6,372. <laughs> I think you're close. We should do that one day. Guess the stitch count without going over. That's a good contest. <laughs> and, and send out a, uh, a nerd star to whoever gets the closest. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, yeah. We have a question, question from Kathleen here. So how would you handle it when a customer brings you a JPEG and wants a quote? Could you quick run it through auto digitizing to get some stitch count, then add percentage to account for underlay? This could uh, more time if, could be more time efficient uh, for more complicated designs. And that's that was going to be my next question for you, Justin. I did it once. It was on a bigger design, and I, I mainly did it to so we would calculate how much, because I knew pretty much the majority of it was going to be fill. Um, it was accurate in, in how much fill area it was going to be, but I noticed that like all the detail in it was coming out as fill stitches. So by the time I actually went in and, and went to the auto digitized design and started making the changes I would need to be more accurate for the stitch count, I would have probably been better off just using this method. So the, the other thing that that doesn't account for too is like if I throw a US flag on here and I hit the auto digitize button, it's going to put a blue fill and white stars, but it's going to have each star cut out in that blue right. fill. And right. when those, when it cuts out those little shapes, now you're adding extra run stitches that are going to be traveling around to basically, you know, outline each little star and then to fill up next to it. And so you get a lot more travel stitches in there and mm -hmm. that can significantly boost your stitch count. And is one of the reasons why if you do a flag, most people just do a flat blue fill and then they'll put the stars on top of it is because that will end up being less stitches in the long run. Right. Right. So this is, this so, yeah. is how I did it. I'll, I, I'll be honest with you on the one that I sent to Justin and said, Justin, what's your guess? I hit the auto digitize button and I was significantly North of what I should have been. And the only thing I could guess is there's probably some satin stitches in there that you and I would have digitized as satins, but they were, they were, calculated and still fill stitches from the software. So I, I, I tend to not lean towards that just because talk about guessing the jelly bean jar. That's, that's definitely the case when it comes to auto digitizing. Sometimes the computer just does some, some weird stuff with that you would never do as, as a digitizer. Um, well, I know like if you take a really colorful design and you throw it through there, now you've got, 58 colors on your color sequence list and each one of them's got a tie in a tie out little travel stitches to get it from where it needs to go all i mean it can really really add stuff in there that you don't want in there right yeah i'm gonna stop sharing here just because my computer is running extremely slow for some reason there we go there we go Justin's getting picked on by his computer today. I think you need a more powerful one. We should all chip into the Justin's new computer fund. <laughs> Alienware. Oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean the biggest thing is 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 to to make sure that you you know at the size that you're gonna be at, like the one that you sent me, okay? Are, are the headphones gonna have a satin border? 
Are you going to do, you know, running stitches on part of it? Um, the areas that have fill stitches, you know, sometimes you tend to, depending on what the design is, sometimes I just do open-ended fills that don't have a, a satin border. If it's a certain look I'm looking for, or uh, like I said before, if you know that typically you use 15% more density when you're doing something on a towel than you do on, on a polo shirt, you can use these values that you come up with using, you know, your calculations and just add 15%. Or you know, 3D uh, 3D puff satins are roughly double, so you double it. Um, again, if you if you are trying to estimate for for pricing purposes, I always tend to err on the side of a little bit higher, just to pad it a little bit. Um, in that I mean, way, I don't think I've ever seen anybody complain about the price being less. No, no. <laughs> yeah, and and and. and yeah, ex exactly. I mean, and some people tend to to if if they they do charge by the stitch count every thousand stitches or whatever or whatever it may be, you know, if it does come out cheaper, then okay, give it to your customer. There's also the the thinking that you quote it as it is, and if you end up coming up over, well, there might be a next time where you are coming out under. And you don't raise the price to them so you just kind of let it go charge for the way you quoted and that over under kind of comes out the average out theory exactly exactly and and i mean however, however you want to run your your business on how you're pricing i'm not going to say either way is better um i mean if you if you quoted somebody in there and they think the price that you quoted is is worth the quality of work you're doing i don't see no harm no foul it's not like you have a, a 2000 stitch design and you charge somebody in 10,000 stitches knowing that it's not going to take that long to do um but i think the estimated stitching like i said is it's it's important to know whether you digitize or not uh just because like someone said earlier someone's going to give you a jpeg you know someone's going to give you something that it's it's not going to be ready for you to, you know, open it up, check the stitches right away. It's not going to be a digitized file. So, so it's, it's important to, to kind of engage. And the more you do it, the more you get used to it as well. And we've got a comment here. Cindy King, we can quote all day for cap logos. We can just not get caps. You know, it's funny because I just had uh, like 30 Richardson 112s. They're sitting in a box behind me. I got lucky. I've got that Richardson gold. Um, for anybody that's looking for Richardsons, I've got 30 of them. I need a new truck. <laughs> and the bidding starts at $20 a hat. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I my, my son would kill me if I got rid of these. Yeah, they are gold right now. Um, oh. So but, go ahead. If, if somebody if, – if you – are a person that um that runs a shop right and you have a digitizer that you use would it be better to ask them for for a formula that they use to guess to estimate stitch count i'm not going to say guesstimate or would it be better to come up with your own formula that you use to estimate stitch count and how would you work with them to make sure that you both kind of come out with the same numbers well i think the best thing is is if, if you'd use a digitizer consistently and you know that you like their work and you're always going to be using them um, you're going to see the style and and typically you're going to like their style and that's the reason why you continue using them so i think paying attention to to like okay this digitizer typically over over a certain width on, on a satin stitch they're going to do fill stitches if they do fill letters typically they're going to satin border them and so if, if you know their tendencies on, on what type of stitches that you, they use and, and, and the way they digitize stuff, I think having something in-house where you're not going to have to wait for them to get back to you is definitely important. So you can just do those quick little estimates when you're, when you're quoting somebody. Um, if it is something where you have a little bit more time and you have that repertoire with your digitizer, yeah, absolutely. Send it to them because they're going to be the ones that have in their brain all right, I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to do it like that. Um, and I think that's where 
there might be a little bit of, of difference in stitch counts depending on if the embroiderer thinks, oh, well, that's that's small enough where I wouldn't do a fill stitch. When the digitizer gets it, he's like, well, yeah, I'm going to do a fill stitch because of X, Y, and Z. Um, then there, there might that be that little difference in, in stitch counts. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you don't do any digitizing in-house or you don't have your digitizer, I think it's always good to have the knowledge, have the tools and everything in-house that you can do something on the fly if needed. Um, but if you do have the time and, and you know you can get a hold of your digitizer quickly and say, hey, I need a quick, quick stitch count, um, I think that's, that's probably best because they're going to be the one that's going to be ultimately setting up the design. You know, and I find I find it interesting. Well, actually, I'm going to pull out a phrase that you see you used is your uh, your digitizer style, and that's something that's really um, every digitizer has their own style, and it's almost like a fingerprint. Oh yeah, <laughs> you can see it. You can see a design, and if you if you've got a lot of experience, you watch a design you run, and if you put a lineup of digitizers, it would be like a crime scene. You'd be like that one. <laughs> A, cust a customer told me that I have a, he knows my DNA of my designs. The DNA like, of your designs. Yeah. Like he, he, he is a contract embroiderer as well. So there's a, there's a lot of contract customers that are bringing their own designs in. And he, he couldn't remember if it was a design that I did or not when he was, it was a repeat. And he says he saw the design on screen. He's like, no, that's not Justin. He could tell just by by the way it was done that it wasn't my one of my files. So yeah, he told me he's like, yeah, I can I can see your DNA in your designs. Well, so. hopefully none of your designs are used in a crime scene because <laughs> it'll come back to you. It'll come back to me. All right, so we have a uh, question here from Carol. If you did quote too low and honored that price, would what would you do when they come back for another run? What would you do in your shop, Justin? If you pr if you price low on a job. And it, they came back and wanted to do another run. How would you handle that? That's a good question. So you, you shot too low the first time and then. Yeah. So let's say that, you know, you quoted me shirts at $15 a shirt and it ended up running more around like $19 a shirt, but you honored the 15 for me. If it's, if it's a big, if it's a big difference, I would, honor the price of that original order and to say, Hey, that, you know, and tell them upon picking up, Hey, you know, this was an estimated price. Now that we have all the files and we know what's going on any future orders, you know, at this quantity, it's going to be X amount. If, if there's a, a major difference where you're going to be losing a lot of money, if it's minor, that's one of those things where, you know, you do what you got to do to, to make your customers happy. And again, if, it, if it's something minor where it's really not going to eat into your profit, I think it's fair to, and that's why I would say to shoot high. You could always come down and, and customers will be happy if you try to go up from there. Typically, they're not too happy. So I know in my experience, when I quote um, too low and they come back after, well, First, when, if I if I shoot too low, and I'm off, when they come pick up the stuff, I'll just be like, yeah, you know, we uh, when we initially talked, it was all kind of estimates. Um, when all the dust settled, uh, it actually turned out being more than I expected. But I'm going to honor the price that I quoted you for this run, right? Because that's what I quoted you. But just to just know, in the future, if you want to do another run, it's going to be closer to, and I'll throw down the value that it actually came to, and right. then that way. They look at it. They understand, hey, I gave this guy a job. He messed up on pricing, but he's giving it to me at that price anyways, even though he messed up. And that's going to, you know, they're going to look at that positive. They're going to say, oh, that's awesome. He's giving me a deal. I really appreciate it. And then you're also setting up there on the backside of that, that, hey, if you need more, I have to charge you more. It's going to be X amount. And you can, you can always remind them, say, hey, but next time you're, you already paid the setup on this one, next time you have the, you don't have the setup fee. You don't have the digitizing fee. So at least you don't have to worry about that, but next time it'll be per, per piece, it'll be a little bit more expensive. Yeah. And so it, it's kind of just how you handle that initial conversation when they come to pick up their first thing or when the, when the prices get off. And we've got some more comments in here. I'm going to grab a couple. Uh, we have Letty, depends on quantity, customer returns, cost of overage. You can always explain differences in supplies, et cetera. But if you're upfront on the first run, they get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. 
I would I would agree with that. And Ramona, that's what I do. Honor my quote. Tell them the error. Explain the new fee per. That's kind of how I do it right there on the when they're picking it up, so that they know the next time before they even come to me that it's going to be more. It's not going to be. It's not going to blindside them the next time they come to order more. Right. Um, and if they're uh, if they're reselling it, so like if I'm doing hats and they're a retail store and they're reselling it, they're going to know that they're going to need to increase their price too when it comes that time, or they might just increase their price that time and plan on it being more money the next time. But it gives them the ability to look forward and understand that, you know what, I'm not going to be able to do this price. I'm going to be able to um, get it at a different price later. So it, it's, it's all about that initial communication. And I, I don't think I've ever had anybody come back mad when I've done that. Um, yeah. They're usually and, happy. I'm not charging them the full price. And like Letty said, the, the quantity is the biggest thing too. I mean, if they only order 12 hats this time, the next time they're going to order 36 hats, and then the next time it's 48 hats, and they're coming back all over the place, the price is going to change regardless. Um, but, you know, if it's somebody that's like, every month I'm going to get, you know, 20 polo shirts, I know I'm going to get that every month, then yeah, that's going to be something where it should stay consistent unless there's, you know, price increase or inflation or whatever it is that raises the price of the garments or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, it's, there's so many variables that they may not even notice because they don't order the same 12 pieces again. Yep. So I'm going to bring in, um, we have Martin Howdy from California. Hello. So we've got one candle here. I was going to say, at least we have one candle tonight, <laughs> but you know, I've, Pricing, stitch count, that all, you know, it, it, it can run together. And I've had it, you know, I recently had somebody come to me and they said, hey, I want 5,000 patches. And after I picked my job up off the floor, I was like, okay, well, let's start pricing. And, and I talked to them a little bit and they, they came out and said, well, you know, it might only be an order of five or 12 at a time, but it'll be a lot, you know, it might be 400 or 500 at a time. So just give me your best average. <laughs> that was the face I made too, Justin. It was like, oh. Yeah, just because you're going to be bringing 5,000 patches over the next three years doesn't mean that you're going to get a 5,000 piece price. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to have to still make them one at a time. <laughs> right. right. And I, at one point, it doesn't get any cheaper. And yeah, that was my fun earlier this week. I've had a fun week with this kind of stuff, Justin. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but um, let's, I, I think we can go ahead and I'm going to bring up my screen here and I'm going to just kind of show what Justin talked about a little bit here and we'll look for more questions and comments. So if you guys have more questions, let us know. If not, we might be ending early. Justin smiled a little bit. He's like, sweet, I can go get food or something. Um, so how Justin uh, initially measured it is he went in here and he basically you just drew a, an object of each and it doesn't sound like it. Whatever I did there, we don't know. There we go. <laughs> That's my wide satin. Don't laugh. <laughs> it's only four inches and my auto splits off. That looks a lot better. And we'll take this and we'll put it at a one inch by one inch square. And I'm going to give it my best shot here. And it's average setting. So by average settings, I'm just going to go ahead and determine that that's going to be the default underlay, which Will Com puts in. It's the edge run underlay, the tatami fill, or the tatami underlay as well. We've got our satin, which is a straight run. And then we've got just a run stitch here. Justin, I'm struggle busting it today. Throw stuff at me. I see that. All right. So we're going to take that. And we're going to put it at one inch there. And we're going to put our satin here at approximately one inch. Hey, I'm getting better at this. I should, I should do this sometimes. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this object here. It should give me, we'll delete these two, pull them out. So this is 233 stitches going in a linear inch. How close is that to your spreadsheet? Do you have a, what's your underlaying density? 
My underlay is edge run and tatami. I'd probably change that to zigzag. And my density is at a, well, it's the auto density. So it's going to be like a 0.38, I think, is what it yeah, defaults so I have to. A point, that was based on a 0.38 with just a center run. Uh, with just a center run? Yeah. Oh, well, that's what you get for not putting in enough underlay, Justin. 183? I got 175. Oh. All right. So we'll go ahead and pull that out and that out. And we've got roughly 1,200 stitches here. We've got an edge run and it's a Tommy. You got those, right? I got 1,200 stitches for Phil. 1,207. So that's we're, we're in the ballpark there. And then we've got the run stitch, which is going to be roughly 28 stitches. So I put it at 50 because typically when I'm counting run stitches, I'm not, I'm not taking into account that I'm not going through and looking at every single travel stitch that I'm going to be doing behind the scenes. But typically when you do running stitches as detail, it's going to be two passes over it. So I take that linear, linear amount and double it because I know, you know, if I'm going to do an outline of a dog, it's not going to just go around the outside once. It's going to go around twice. So that's why I didn't base it on 50. Gotcha. So I'll grab a couple more comments here. We have Cindy that says, I don't go for the more, the cheaper. It's still work. Absolutely. And a 5,000 patch order over three years. Well, your price pick will happen in year three after adjustments and increase for inflation. <laughs> Oh, I like that. I'm going to use that next time. So basically, we've got this set up here. Justin, you referenced that you wrote a blog article. I did. All right. So if we talk about the blog, we're going to talk about that just a little bit. For those of you guys that are interested, if you go to, let me unshare my screen here. Oh, I'll click that button. And you go to jadigitizing.com. Absolutely. Click on the education tab. All right. And so I'm going to bring that back up because I can do that. And my computer's not slow like yours. Oh, I should move this over to the right screen. <laughs> Let's do that. There Here's we the go. So you've got the webinars here that we've done, uh, featured videos, the JA digitizing blog, and the Facebook there. So if you go here, you can look up. Um, I just posted the link. I'm going to throw stuff at you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be, I mean, be efficient. We, we like that. So you guys can look at that. And you can roll through and look at some of the, um, the articles that Justin has written on his site. So we'll go ahead and plug him today because he put the link in the, in the thing. Oh, you even, oh, did I not put my screen up at all? No, he didn't. All right. So if you go to jadigitizing.com, you click on education and you click on the blog. Now we're in the blog part and you can go ahead and look at the different articles that Justin has written out on this. Um, and other topics. There we go. Knowledge is key. And I'll take that down. So we went through that a lot faster than I planned. It's, it's like I said, it's a... Uh... It's something that takes practice, um, takes planning. You, you, you need to know at least the tools of digitizing and, and, and how your digitizer thinks and their DNA and, and their fingerprint and all that good stuff. Um, so as long as you have your, your digitizer's fingerprints and DNA, then you'll be fine. Um, no, it's it's just a matter of, of getting used to it. Like I said, I can... I can take a design as long as it's it's in front of me to scale or if it's on screen to scale, I could run through in my in my head and kind of say like, all right, fill stitches are going to be about this this amount. I can kind of glance over it and know how many square inches there is estimating it. So, but I've been doing this for eons and eons. So, um, I you did it before I mean, computers were born. Exactly. I used to chisel out those designs all the time. Um, I think having the grid on your on your Corel or your Illustrator, whatever artwork program that you have, it, it gives you a visual so you can kind of see the design. Make sure your designs to scale when you bring it into your to your artwork. 
program. Um, or <clears throat> if, you, if you are quoting a lot of stuff that's on physical paper and you're printing out stuff and you're trying to estimate it, you know, grab a ruler. You know, most rulers are about an inch thick, uh, an inch wide. If you take that one inch mark, you know that you have an inch square. So you can kind of go over your artwork and be like, all right, there's about 10 linear or 10 square inches in the design. It's going to be this much per, per square inch. So um, again, just making sure you know what kind of stitch is where, what type of garment. So you know you need to make any adjustments if you are doing something that needs extra density, it's extra underlays. Uh, and, and if you do have the software and you do have a question, if you if it is something special and like, oh, well, I know that it's going to be a pretty wide satin stitch and it's going to be on a towel. So it's going to be really extra density. It's going to be really extra underlay. Uh, throw it in your, your software really quick. Get what that linear inch is going to be. And that way, you know, for the rest of the calculations, you're going to know for sure it's correct. So. Just a matter of tinkering with your software, talking to your digitizer, or leave it up to your digitizer if, if you don't feel comfortable. So I'm going to give a tip here. It's a secret. Shh, not really. If you get a quilting ruler, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a quilting ruler. I don't know if you have, Justin. But they're actually a grid ruler. So they're like six to eight inches wide. They're right. semi-transparent, and they've got a full grid in them. So you can yeah. just lay it down on top. You'll see that full one inch grid. They're really, really handy. So you might want to yeah, pick those up at your quilt shop. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's the, there's those. I know there's a lot of drafting rulers that are like that, um, that have the basically clear with all the, the denotations of, of sizing and whatnot in a grid. But yeah, something like that. It's definitely helpful. So I'm going to grab a few comments here. We now have the other Campbell here. We have Eric. It's a good post. Hello, Eric. We have Cindy. I hope the 3D puff glasses are available for a long time. I paid for all three, but so busy I cannot watch right now. So unless if there is a massive explosion of the internet, <laughs> they're gonna be they're gonna be available for a really long time. Um, we've got those up and backed up and backed up again. So um, as far as we're aware, they're gonna be there till Justin's older and grayer and probably when you just have to look at a computer and it does what you want rather than exactly. actually input stuff. That's where you can just enter my DNA and it'll know how to digitize something. This is what Justin wants. Stab my finger, <laughs> blood yeah. drop. There we go. So Eric says it certainly benefits from experience. Quit saying eons though. And we have Ramona here. Quilt <laughs> rulers, inches, angles, fractions of inches. Love my rulers. Yeah, I've got a couple, but mainly because I have that problem, I'll put it down and it'll be over there and then I'll turn around and I'll forget where it is. And so then I have to go get a new one. But when I get the new one, then I remember where it was. So um, we've got Cindy here that says I have gotten through one and a half of them. <laughs> and uh, Justin, if you want to go ahead and drop the, uh, the links for the webinars in there. Can the 3D classes still be purchased? Absolutely, they can uh, on the Embroidery Nerds website. Justin's going to drop a link into the comments if you guys would like to check those out. Um, but with that, that's pretty much everything that we planned on covering. We are going to get out of here about 15 minutes early. So hopefully you guys uh, can go spend some family time. Um, I'm going to grab a couple more questions here because they're starting to come in a little bit. We have uh, Ramona here. Put a nail on the wall and hang your rulers, silly. Um, Mike, Michael Ortiz off topic is a 3d puff class, just digitizing or does it have tips on running it on your machine? Justin, if you want to take that one, uh, the first one is start to finish the process of 3d puff from, uh, the tools that you need from the digitizing to on the machine to the cleanup. So that one's going to be your, your overall, uh, from start to finish uh, in the process. So there's not really all that much digitizing other than the stuff you really need to know specifically the 3d. Uh, there's an intermediate one that has a little bit more advanced techniques that's a little bit more digitizing and then the third one is the uh the well the second one was intermediate and the third one is the advanced where we got real creative and got into some some really cool stuff so it's, yep. it's both if you're not a digitizer um i think this information is definitely uh very valuable to know so 
Yeah. In my opinion, if you don't want to, if you don't ever want to digitize, it never hurts to know how it should run on your machine. So you can identify, you know, if, if your digitizer gives you a file and there's a mistake in it, you can see that on the initial sew out and not, you know, you save yourself a lot of trouble. And I'll be honest with you guys. I had, um, I, I generated a file for somebody. I gave it to them. Something weird happened on the file export and it put in 375 trims. She came back to me after three days and she said, you know, I really love this. It looks great. It takes forever to run. Is there a reason why it's trimming so much? <laughs> and I pulled up the file and it was like, oh crap. Why didn't you come to me? Like that's an immediate, you know, you see it and you right. come back. So if it's, in these classes, even if you don't want to learn how to digitize, it still helps to know kind of the flow of how a file is supposed to run, going to run, because then that can help you, especially with your production time. And in her case, she would have come back immediately and said, this isn't right. I need it fixed. Right. Which I would have much rather preferred because I felt horrible that she spent so much time running her machine when she didn't have to. Exactly. Um, yeah. So yeah. It's a learning the techniques and, and what's actually used to, to make sure that the foam is cut and make sure the foam is, is kept in the place. You, so, you know, if there is stitches that may not be in there, if you're having a problem area where you're getting a lot of thread breaks or, or needle breaks and you, and you can go back to your digitizer and say, Hey, you know, this, this bridge over here on this part of the design, every time it gets to that bridge, I'm really getting a, a thread break every single time. So as a digitizer, I'm going to go to that section. I, I know exactly what she's referring to uh, and, and say, all right, then this is exactly where I need to fix it or I need to adjust it. I need to move some angles or whatever it may be, density. And sometimes it, it can be just simply changing the density, just a hair. And there's that one little stitch that, you know, it's not it's not too short of a stitch that's going to that's gonna fix the problem. But yeah, everything... Everything in there. I mean, the 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 advanced one. You're gonna get a little bit more advanced techniques and 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 really get into the stuff if you're if you're trying to make that that really wow design. Uh, but the the first and second one is is definitely more technique and stuff that's that's really good to know. All right, and so I'm gonna actually bring this up because this reinforces what we were just saying. Josh Ship, digitizer himself, says yes. Everyone should know some basic idea of digitizing. You don't have to be a pro on it, but it does help to understand what's happening on your machine. So Absolutely. I fully agree with that. I'm going to grab a couple more here. Letty says, and you don't easily see them being clear with the rulers. Absolutely. Cindy King, great information tonight. Thank you all. You're welcome. And Carol, sometimes unintentional things just happened and it sucks. Yeah. You know, it's in files, digitizers are people too. They make mistakes and it'll get out and, the only way they'll know about it is if you come back. Justin's like, no, they never get out. <laughs> I had a customer actually come back today on a file I sent him, and somehow it was it was like a lion face, and there was some some satin stitches that were making up the main. And I don't know what I did, just fast clicking, I duplicated them. So it came came to you know left to right doing the main. It came back and did the same satins again over. And he emailed and said, is there any reason why it does it twice? You know, because he caught it that it's doing it twice, but he wanted to know, is there a reason why you did this? Or I'm like, no, that's that's a mistake. So I had to remove those and, and send it back to him. Yep. So with that, we'll go ahead and run through what we've got going on in the week here. We have tomorrow is Education Friday. Uh, the two regular guys will be on at their same time every day. The half. Uh, which I really like the half. It's one of the funner things with their hard 30 minute cutoff. And um, then Eric Campbell's a take up as well. So I definitely recommend that you catch those coming up here in a week from Saturday. We're going to have Lee Caracelli. Uh, she's going to be doing a, the extended webinar, the part two of her webinar on blending and shading. I'm really excited for that. She's got a, uh, an Apple design that's going to be going out there with that. So that's going to be really, really cool. Um, I think Justin's grabbing the link for that. If not, I'll get the link in there. I'm, I'm going to be sharing that link a few more times, at least for a little bit. Um, that's what we have going on. Fort Worth, uh, Impressions Expo at Fort Worth. We will all be there. Me, myself, Justin, Jerry Lee, Eric, Matt, uh, Ramona is going to be there. It's going to be a great time. So I highly recommend making it to that show if you can. 
uh, cause it'll be a lot, it'll be a lot of fun. And I'm going to grab a couple more comments here. We have Ja again, Jeff, you're funny about nothing bad goes out. I love your shows while I play around on my stuff. Glad you like them, man. It, it's good to know that people like to come and show up and hang out with us. So, um, we've got Eric copy and paste errors. That's my rough one. I've definitely seen it. And, uh, Eric, thanks for the kind words. I'll be hosting two regular guys tomorrow too. Awesome. Definitely look forward to that. You guys, uh, but with that, that's everything we had that we were going to cover. We appreciate all you guys hanging out with us. I'm Jeff Fuller. That's Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios, the Embroidery Nerd, and 3D Puff Pro. And I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works and the Embroidery Nerd. And we'd like to thank you guys for hanging out with us tonight. We'll talk to you guys later.